Brian Portnoy, PhD, CFA, is the author of the Axiom Business Book Award winning book, The Geometry of Wealth, How to Shape a Life of Money and Meaning. Today on Your Money, Your Wealth, Brian talks about the difference between being rich and being wealthy and how to achieve both. Plus, what about tax brackets? Joe and Big Al respond to a listener challenge about their critique of Rick Edelman's critique of the Roth IRA. And the fellas answer money questions about the difference between a Roth contribution and a Roth conversion, the five-year clock on a Roth IRA, and the difference between transferring funds and doing a rollover. All questions that highlight the importance of understanding the vocabulary of finance when it comes to your retirement planning. This week, we've got two ways for you to get a free copy of Larry Swedro's book, Think, Act, and Invest Like Warren Buffett, for which Joe and Big Al wrote the foreword, so keep listening. I'm producer Andy Last, and here with our guest, Brian Portnoy, are the hosts of Your Money, Your Wealth, Joe Anderson, CFP, and Big Al Clopine, CPA. Alan, you got a PhD, CFA, <laughs> joining us today, I Brian know. Portnoy. Right. Uh, wrote a great book, uh, The Geometry of Wealth. This is the first time I think you've ever read someone's book before they came on. I know. C- can you believe it? <laughs> no, I can't, actually. <laughs> I- I'm still curious if you're BSing me. <laughs> His good buddy we had on, Dr. Daniel Crosby, a few weeks ago, wrote The Behavioral Investor. In both these books, these buddies, they right. both conspired or sure. something, and then they just won a gold medal for, what, the 2019 Axiom Business Book Award. Uh, so congratulations to Brian Portnoy, and thank you very much for joining the show, my friend. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Hey, can you give our uh, listeners just a, a little flavor of the life of Brian Portnoy? Yeah, well, The Life of Ryan was a Monty Python movie, and my life is considerably less interesting than that, so I'll, I'll give it a shot to come in second place. Uh, sure, yeah, I've been in the uh, investment and money business for north of 20 years now in various you know, research and, and strategy roles. A lot of my focus over the last 10 years or so has been writing in the field of behavioral finance. You mentioned my friend Daniel Crosby, who also writes in this field, and that's just a fancy term for investor psychology or you know, how we're wired to make just terrible decisions about money and what we might do differently about it. So I've been kind of writing about investment strategy, uh, investment decision making for a number of years, and you know, my latest output is the geometry of wealth. You know, this geometry of wealth and behavioral finance might help me out. It's the start of March Madness, and I went to the University of Florida, and they just got into the tournament, and of course, I picked them to win it all. So, you know, I think I need some lessons. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I I think you're too far gone, but... uh... You know, um, what, what is that called? Is it familiar bias? What bias do I have when I pick my alma mater to win the whole March Madness tournament? I think it's just being called a homer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, (laughs) That could be it too. (laughs) uh, Yeah, it it is availability bias, or you could also say familiarity bias. You know, we we know the things that we know, the things that are right in front of us, and you know, if you you have the impression that your team is good and you know who the players are, and you, you don't know much about the players on the other teams, you tend to put more weight on what you do know, and you know, there's also just the human element of of wishful thinking to that. We want our teams to do well. Don't need a PhD to understand uh, wishful thinking. (laughs) So, Brian, I've got a number of questions. I love the book from the standpoint that you give a lot of tips on, on how to invest properly, how to make money, but it's a lot deeper than that. It's like have a purpose behind it. And, and I think you start off right off the bat talking about a difference between being rich and being wealthy. So can you explain that? Yeah, and I appreciate the question because it's the important place to start. You know, I've been in the investment business for a long time. And, you know, most of what we focus on in the world of managing stocks and bonds or client portfolios is growing something from smaller to bigger. Ten's better than nine, twenty's better than ten. You know, more is what we want. And so much of our money life is built around getting rich, which is just having more money. And there's just an overwhelming amount of evidence from behavioral psychology and and other disciplines that show that that quest for more is not particularly satisfying. That quest to be rich, even if you want a million dollars and next thing you know, you want 1.5 and you get there and you want two and it never really ends. There's something in psychology known as the hedonic treadmill, which is a fancy, somewhat weird way of saying that, you know, life is very much a treadmill and you kind of go and go and go, but you don't get much further no matter how hard you try. I want to distinguish that being rich or having more money with being truly wealthy. And I define true wealth as the ability to underwrite a meaningful life. 
And my shorthand for that phrase is funded contentment. What we're really searching for is funded contentment. We want to lead meaningful lives. We want to do things that are really, really important to us. But we also have to deal with the aggravating and frustrating part of it, which is that money kind of figures into every dimension of the decisions that we make about a good life. And, you know, in modern living, that's hard to shake. So I'd say finance wonks, they, they focus on the funded part, the fancy stocks and bonds part, but I think we need to flip the script and focus first on what, what's really driving our underlying happiness, and then how do we afford a meaningful life. So how, how do you go about that? I mean, how do you figure out what's important to you? You mean other than buying my book? Yeah, <laughs> correct. <laughs> Um, You know, that is the path that I do try to chart out. And I think there's three steps to it. The first is to be honest with oneself at minimum and and hopefully with your family and your financial advisor in terms of what's really meaningful to you. And in the book, I walk through a number of things that could count connection to others, that sense of belonging is, is very important, sense of control that you have over your life, competence, you know, the idea that you have mastery over a skill or a passion for a hobby that's really meaningful for you and work generally for all of us as a major source of identity. Those are the deeper sources of meaning for us. And once you have a sense of that, you want to then set priorities. You know, I talk in the book about setting uh, three broad financial priorities, managing risk in your life so that you can hedge against catastrophe, and then beyond that, matching your assets and liabilities. I, I think it's super important just from a nuts and bolts point of view for people to have a balance sheet that gives them clarity to their financial situation. And then beyond that, kind of reach for the things that really matter to us. And then once you've kind of articulated your purpose and and then moved on to your big priorities, then you can kind of get into the weeds in terms of making decisions about the market, about investing. I think a big challenge for all of us is that the way the script is in the financial advice business and when we turn on financial television is that we focus on the opposite end first. We start with the investing and the stocks and bonds, the stuff that seems interesting and sexy and fascinating and fun. And we forget the fact that all of that is geared toward actually solving a problem or underwriting meaning that you want. So I wanted to kind of right-size the script and move it in the right direction. Yeah, that's, that's a very good mission. It's an uphill battle, to say the least. Al, you've been a CPA for 30, 40 years helping people you know, figure out their financial lives, and I've been doing this a few days. You know, Our goal and mission is just to figure out exactly what they're, what, what's the money for. And most people, it's, it's hard for them to define what the money's for. It's always looking to get to a certain number. It's like, well, here, if I get to a million dollars, I feel that I'll be secure. But if you're spending $500,000 a year, that money's not going to last you very long. you got to work it backwards in pushing people to work things backwards to find out what the money's for, what is actually meaningful in their lives, and what can money do to provide that is challenging. So I applaud your efforts on trying to flip the switch um, or flip the script. Um, either mm-hmm. one, I think, works. Um, yeah, sure. Because that is the true component. Al and I see people that have millions of dollars that are miserable, and we see people that have a couple of bucks that they're happiest people on earth. And I think they figured it out. So it's going through several different exercises. That's a challenge to put people through, uh, because I think it's that softer side of finance where most people, I think, think of finance as, as mm-hmm. the hard number. Yeah, I, I think that's right. One of the words I like to use a lot in this exercise is calibration. What we really want is to calibrate our purpose with our plan. You know, it's it's one thing to walk along the beach or take a hike in the mountains and, and think about the good life. You know, that, that that's a nice exercise, but it's very incomplete. Yes, you need to step back and ask, well, what's really important to me? And the book does try to provide some vocabulary and some mental models for thinking through that. But then it needs to be attached to a plan. I mean, we can't forget that most clients of financial advice firms don't have a financial plan, which means like a real game plan that kind of gets you from from A to Z. You know, a lot of us will meet with a financial advisor or hang out with our friends, and the conversation will be about, well, what's the best investment? where can I find the next Amazon? Is the price of oil going up and down? And I, and I can tell you that those questions generally are largely irrelevant to this principle of funded contentment. When I say that true wealth is the ability to underwrite a meaningful life, 
that means that you just need to be calibrated and you gave the perfect example. You've got clients who have a ton of dough and they're pretty miserable, so they're not calibrated. And you have other clients who they don't have much of a nest egg, but they're probably more self-aware. They've sort of matched up what they own versus what they owe, so they live responsibly. And they're leading a pretty good life. So you can be very rich, but not wealthy and vice versa. I got a question for you. So you have a CFA, and so at some point, I would imagine he's, so you got deep in the weeds and the numbers in the markets mm-hmm. and trying to figure out when that you can buy that next Amazon. And then did something happen in your professional, personal life to say, you know what? And I'm, I'm guessing you got your PhD from the University of Chicago, more on the behavioral um, finance side of things. Or so the last 10 years, you've been writing more on behavioral than mm-hmm. versus, mm-hmm. you know, hey, let's talk about factor investing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. And it's, and it's a perceptive question because, yeah, things have changed for me as they do for everybody as they grow older and have families. And, you know, from a career perspective, yeah, I was in the weeds for a long time. This is my second book. I wrote a, a first book that was more, you know, sort of how to evaluate mutual funds and hedge funds and generally make better investment decisions. As I wrapped up that project and kind of looked out on my career, but also took stock of where I was in my life, I, I did begin to think, you know, picking the right fund manager is not all that it's cracked up to be and, and really has almost nothing to do with the things that really matter. And so family with three growing kids, I, I did have sort of more of a personal revelation where it's like, you know what, I want to write a prequel. And so The Geometry of Wealth is a prequel to The Investor's Paradox and a prequel in the sense that the investing piece, the making good stock and bond and fund decisions, it's really the end of the process. But something has to come before that for all of this to be very meaningful. And as I look out to 2030, 2035, and couldn't even guess what the world's going to look like, but that'll be when my kids are ramping up in their careers. I'm thinking, okay, do they need good primer on stocks and bonds? Or do they need maybe some insight into how money figures into a happy life? And it's the latter that's really been motivating me for the last few years. I was expecting an answer like that, but then I also was thinking that you would say, well, you know what, I spent a long time in my career trying to figure out the markets, trying to mm-hmm. look at, you know, how do you find, you know, the next XYZ stock before it blows up. And with all the information and education that you have, you know, over the last 25 years, what's really going to make you wealthy is, yeah, you, you know, find the purpose, but also trying to identify stocks within the market and buying them before something actually happens is almost impossible. Mm-hmm. So yes. if I can just control my damn nerves, in emotions when the market blows up and understand that things are going to be okay, that's probably worth a little bit more than finding the next Amazon or, or Netflix or Facebook or whatever stock that you want to throw in there. So, so this is great because let's just stick to being rich. Forget the wealthy stuff for, you know, so maybe some of your listeners like, oh, that's just all gooey and soft and, you know, I just want more money. If we're just talking about, you know, growing X into 2X and 3X, yeah, the, the exercise of trying to find the next Netflix or predict how uh, the next political election is going to impact the direction of the stock market, I mean, th- those are largely fool's errands. That's really not the way to compound your money over time. The main way is to avoid taking big bets and, and making ill-informed decisions that can undermine you, and instead blocking and tackling, having a reasonably priced, diversified portfolio, and letting that compound over time, and keeping your saving and spending in check. The problem when I say things like that, because I do do a lot of public speaking, is people look at me like, well, no, duh, of course. And then my comeback is, well, that's kind of it. You know, if you want to lose weight, you probably want to eat healthier and exercise a bit more. The issue isn't whether you have the instruction manual. The issue is whether you can stick to the plan. And that's where we come full circle to the behavioral finance. The key to being rich, and, and again, we're leaving the, the wealthy stuff, which I think is more important, off to the side. The key to being rich is not trying to beat the market. It's trying to be actually the best version of yourself and not letting your built-in biases derail you from allowing your assets to compound over the decades. It's funny how we're kind of hardwired, though. I mean, we could figure out what's our purpose, what do we want our life to look like, what's important to us, and 
we could come up with, uh, as you say, the right priorities. And okay, and, and then it's like, okay, here's the right investment plan. But then mm-hmm. some, we're kind of hardwired to do the wrong things from uh, actually quite often you know, when it comes to investing. Totally. And, and that's why, you know, in this geometry of wealth concept, which is anchored in three basic shapes. The first shape is a circle. You know, it's a round world. We're, we're never done figuring this out. It's why I find the concept of the number to be actually a, a bad thing. A lot of folks say, well, you know, my number is X. If I only had a million dollars, if I only had $5 million, then when I get to that point, I'm going to be good. I'm going to be able to take care of everything. And, and in point of fact, we know this anecdotally, but it's also true from a social psychology research point of view, there's no one number that's going to make you happy at that particular point. And we're always going to have to be revisiting what our purpose and and priorities are. It goes around and around. So there's this underlying idea that I wrote about in Geometry of Wealth that I call adaptive simplicity. It's the idea that we always want to be moving towards simple. We always want to be moving towards a, a plan that we can stick with but we have to appreciate that everybody gets knocked off their game. It's never the case. There's not a single human alive where every plan goes just as they'd like, and we need to pivot. We need to adapt. And with the amount of information and disruption that we're dealing with in our lives these days, all of us, that's just part of the story. We shouldn't see the need for adaptation or pivoting as a problem. We should see it as an opportunity to keep doing better, to update. And I think the people who embrace the process of adaptation are generally happier in the moment than the ones who say, you know what, this hasn't worked out the way I hoped, and now I need to start from scratch. Great stuff. We're talking to Brian Portnoy. Check him out at shapingwealth.com, shapingwealth.com. The Geometry of Wealth, it's his latest book, The Geometry of Wealth. Brian, people can purchase that where all finer books are sold, I imagine. You mean Amazon? I've, I, I've heard that's, of that. Yeah, that's what he means. I thought maybe just that's go a to small, a small upcoming bookseller. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's available in all the, the regular spots, the Amazons and Barnes and Nobles and stuff. Yeah. Final question. Do you have a team for the, the tournament? Go Blue. Go Blue. Duke? Or no, Michigan? Michigan. Okay. Oh, my okay. gosh. <laughs> Jeez. Like, that's the part where I get to hang up? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, you can. Well, well, I suppose, did you go to University of, uh, what, well, you're from Chicago. Yeah. What, did you grow no. up in Detroit or what? Nope, grew up in Pittsburgh, school in Ann Arbor, grad school in Chicago. So I'm gradually moving west. Oh, Wolverines. Go blue. Yeah, yeah I'm a Wolverine. Well, Michigan so, State uh, has had your uh, your number there for the past couple of games, so we'll see. If, uh, uh, that is absolutely true. They Sparty. Just, uh, yeah, no, they just gave it up here at the uh, United Center here in Chicago. Uh, another miserable loss to those guys, but uh, hope springs eternal. Yes, yes. Thanks, Brian. I appreciate your wisdom and everything that you do for uh, the investment community. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. For a transcript of this interview and links to Brian Portnoy's website and his book, The Geometry of Wealth, visit the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Now it's time to answer your emails. If you've got money questions or comments, scroll down to Ask Joe and Al on air at yourmoneyyourwealth.com and send the fellas a voice recording or an email right through the site. They'll respond right here on the podcast. You'll get a free copy of the book, Think, Act, and Invest Like Warren Buffett by Larry Swedrow. And I might even send you a video of Joe and Big Al's answer to your question. Question. Keep listening for the second way to get your free book. In the meantime, let's get to those emails, and you can bet this one's got a video. Check the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Uh, Fred writes in, Al. So I guess we, we touched a chord uh, a couple weeks ago. Maybe it was last week. We talked about um, Edelman's view on Roth IRAs, and we gave our opinion on Yeah, I guess one of our listeners had a different take. He goes, yeah, I listen to your podcast that deals with crit- – with the critique of the Roth IRA, and I have to agree with Rick Edelman on this one, uh, the one issue that was not addressed in the podcast was the difference between the tax bracket when depositing and the tax bracket when withdrawing the money. Most Americans will not be able to retire with the same income they enjoyed while working. They will be in a much lower tax bracket when they withdraw the money than when they deposited the money. If this was not the case, then I stand corrected. Uh, but I doubt most households making $100,000 a year have $2 million, 4% rule, plus Social Security and their retirement funds. 
I'd be very interested in hearing your thoughts on this subject. Um, all right. Fred, I agree and disagree with you. Um, you're right. I would say that the, when you hear about the average person, the median balance of a retirement plan is abysmal. There's not a lot of money. Half of the population does not file a tax return. Right. So what I say, the majority of individuals will retire in a lower tax bracket in retirement than they are right now. I would with, agree with you with, with 100% certainty. Um, unfortunately, what w- w- when you're looking at tax planning and tax planning strategies, those strategies apply to individuals um, that pay taxes. So if I don't have a retirement account and I'm going to live off of maybe pension and Social Security, then you know there's no need to even think about or hear or listen to a podcast about Roth IRAs or Roth conversions. Um, and also, you know, a, a lot of people will be in a lower tax bracket without question. But I think a lot of people that listen to this program also want to maintain their same lifestyle, that have done a pretty good job of savings, that have Social Security, that have real estate income, that have pension income, and that have saved several million dollars in retirement accounts. Uh, those individuals, I think, would absolutely benefit from a conversion. Also, we look at brackets in regards to if I'm going to be in X bracket today and maintain that same bracket, so let's say I'm in the 15% tax bracket today, taxable income of roughly $80,000, and I want to be in a the same bracket in retirement, does a conversion make sense? We believe it does. It gives you a lot more diversity when you're pulling assets out. If I'm going, And also the 12% tax bracket today is due to go up to 15%. If I'm in the 25% tax bracket today, or the 22% tax bracket, is there a likelihood chance of me getting into the 25% tax bracket in retirement because the 22 is going back to 25? Al and I have been doing this a couple of weeks, and we see that, yes, that happens often. So it really depends, of course, on the circumstance. But I agree with your statement. Is like, yeah, with a lot of people making $100,000 a year, do we see these people having a couple million dollars in retirement accounts? Not necessarily, no. Yeah, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, Joe. And I think the that and maybe we didn't really express this well enough in that in that critique is you always have to look at your tax bracket today. Yeah, I mean we, we ver- just took that as a gift. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we take you look at it today versus the future. Now, if you're in the 37 percent tax bracket today and in retirement you've saved nothing, you're going to be in the 12 percent or 15 as it's going to become. Absolutely not. Roth conversions would make zero sense, right? But if you, in a lot of cases, what we find is folks save the majority of their savings in retirement accounts, and they want to live the same lifestyle. And a lot of the people that we talk to have the have the savings to be able to do that, whether it's savings, pension, Social Security, real estate, whatever it may be. And so when you look at that, then it's like, well, wait a minute. If they want to live the same lifestyle and they got to basically pull every dollar out of their retirement plan – then that they are by definition going to be in the same tax bracket. In some cases, higher tax brackets because their required minimum distribution is more than they need, so that that's part of it, or because their home mortgage is paid off so they don't even itemize their deductions anymore. All that has to be looked at on a very individualized basis. It's very hard to say it generally everyone should do this because everyone's situation is different. But if if, uh, if someone who's listening, if they know they're going to be in a lower tax bracket in retirement than they are right now, a Roth conversion may not make sense. But then um, I would say most people that are looking at a retirement income strategy and it's like, okay, um, I'm five, ten years out from retirement – you know, then you have to look at it fairly closely. But let's say if I'm a younger listener, if I'm 20, 30, 40 years old, um, then you've got the time component of how that tax-free compound growth will then some point outpace um, the, the traditional IRA. Uh, but that's a totally different argument. That's a totally different thing that we, 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 we usually never touch on. What we look at is to say, if I need to replicate the same paycheck that I'm getting today or something similar, maybe it's a little bit less. But what we find, again, doing this for as long as we have, is that a lot of our clients, a lot of people that seek really good financial planning advice, spend more money. You know, they're going on trips. They're going on vacations. They're redoing their house. They're buying an RV. They're spoiling their grandkids. 
you know, because it's Saturday every day once you're retired and you find time to spend money. So most people want to, in, in our scenarios, in, our, in, in I guess in, a, in, in this assumption, they want to replicate their paycheck. And if everything is in their 401k plan and everything is coming out taxed just like their paycheck minus FICA tax, um, the likelihood of them being in a significantly lower tax bracket, I don't know, we find it, they don't. Something else that a lot of most people don't know, most accountants, I would say, don't even know this, and that is when you're in the lowest tax bracket or the lowest two tax brackets, which is now 10 percent and 12 percent, and it used to be 10 and 15 percent. So I'm going to use the 15 percent amount. So a lot of folks that were in that bracket receiving Social Security, their income was high enough that it would force more of their Social Security income to be taxable. And if you can follow this, you add an extra dollar of income, it makes another 85 cents of Social Security taxable. And what we were seeing before this new tax law is that folks that thought they were in the 15% bracket were actually in the 27% bracket. When you look at the what we call marginal, or a few more dollars out of my IRA is going to cause a higher tax, there, in that situation in particular, getting money into the Roth IRA would be very beneficial. Right, because what you have to look at, at that compo- or, or, or in that circumstance, Circumstances, their provisional income. How is their Social Security going to be taxed? What does that look like? So it's half of the Social Security plus their adjusted gross. But they don't include Roth IRA distributions from provisional income. So if there's a way that you can then push out, let's say, your Social Security income, do Roth IRA conversions to a certain bracket, and then get a lot of the retirement accounts into a Roth, and then you you can reduce the RMD to keep you from a 0% tax bracket from a provisional standpoint, or maybe only 50% of your Social Security benefits are subject to tax, right? and then you can take additional distributions from a Roth IRA um, and have a lot higher cash flow right? without um, you, you know, getting yourself into a higher tax bracket, I think that makes sense. Yeah, and one other thing, I, I hate to say it, but in terms of married couples, one, one, dies. one will survive the other. And the survivor now is a single taxpayer. The tax brackets are cut in half. So now it's like you're, you've got virtually or almost the same income, right? But you're hitting those next brackets much sooner. How about um, this? They're looking at um, changing the stretch IRA provision that only $450,000 then can be stretched. What that means is stretch out the tax liability over the beneficiary's life expectancy. If you have a large IRA and you've got to split that thing out within five years, I mean, that could blow your kids' tax brackets up. So if you can do it strategically and convert into lower tax brackets over a next you know, 5, 10, 50, 20 years, does that make sense? So there, there's multiple ways of looking at this. So when you look at hearing Roth conversion, and then it's like, well, you know, if I'm going to be in a lower tax bracket in retirement, because that's what everyone says. That's, I mean, that's the biggest fallacy to most people that have saved money. Because a lot of our, a lot of things that we see, yes, they're in the same bracket or higher. But as a country as a whole, yes, they will be in a lower tax bracket. So I agree with you there. But I think you're missing the point of strategic planning. And we don't know anyone that's listening out there. I'm, I don't got a balance sheet in front of me. We're just throwing out ideas to see if it catches you know, someone's interest. And then what they do is they blow it up and then they email us later and say, hey, I think I did this wrong. Yeah, we have, that does happen. <laughs> Just got this one hot off the press. This is, um, my husband and I attended one of your retirement workshops. From that, we made the decision to pull $10,000 from my 401k rollover and open a Roth IRA. I made a $9,000 deposit and banked $1,000 with the IRS. Well, in doing our taxes, we took a hit for over-depositing. We have now withdrawn the excess, and I'm getting a check back. Can we make this deposit in my husband's name without penalty? No idea what she's talking about. <laughs> Zero clue. Well, uh, here, here's what I think. Uh, let me try to dissect it, and then while I'm doing saying that, you can chime in if you think something different. So the first sentence, with the decision to pull $10,000 from my 401k rollover and open a Roth IRA. So maybe she pulled the money out and had to pay taxes on it, and then she tried to do a Roth contribution for the 9000 She was trying to do a, a Roth conversion, but she, she, I think she got those two terms mixed up. And so then she had to pull out the excess, because she was only allowed to put in, say, $6,000. That's a guess. That's, <laughs> that's a pretty that's good a guess. Total guess. So 
All right. Yeah, that makes sense. Instead of doing a conversion, she's like, all right, well, here, I'm going to just take a distribution of $10,000, withhold $1,000 in tax. Yeah. That's and then I, I got $9,000. I'm going to deposit the $9,000 into my Roth IRA. Right. And then the, I guess TurboTax is saying, hey, you made a Roth IRA, and it's an excess contribution. Right. And so they're sending a check back. Well, she well she found out yeah she found out it's too much and and so she's got to pull, you know what what was last year fifty five hundred plus a and, uh, thousand dollar cash yeah thousand yeah. if if she's over fifty so let's just say sixty five hundred so maybe she has to pull back twenty five hundred let's just say, and could she put that in her husband's account um, potentially, I mean she whether he's working or not he could use spousal income so that's that's possible. See, this is the problem with people listening to. Snippets. Snippets? Yes, yeah. Or, or in this case, they actually came to a workshop, and they, they got confused between a conversion and a contribution. And those are two completely different things. It sounds like a similar word. A contribution is you take some of your current earnings and you contribute it to a Roth IRA. A conversion is you take money out of your IRA or 401k and convert it to a Roth. They're two completely different things with two different kind of tax treatments. Yeah, one comes from cash and one comes from a retirement account. Right. The one that came from cash, you've already paid taxes on it, so when you do the, the contribution, there's no additional tax. But if it comes out of your IRA or 401k, that's pre-tax. When you do the conversion, you have to pay tax on it. I think that's what she was trying to do. And so a conversion is unlimited. So if she wanted to put the $10,000 of the IRA as a conversion into the Roth, she would be able to do that. There would be no excess contribution. Correct. Because there is no limit. Yeah. But there is limits on contributions up to 5500 or sixty five if you're over 50. Yeah, right. So, um, yeah, that was that's kind of a big blow up. Yeah, well... At least it's not a big dollar amount. Yeah. At least for you and me, maybe for some people. Good thing. I mean, ten. How about if it's a hundred grand? Yeah. Or yeah, five hundred thousand. <laughs> made a contribution of five hundred thousand. <laughs> yep, we won't take that. Okay, so yes, the Roth IRA is great, but it's complicated. If you want the basics, download the Roth IRA Basics white paper from the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. And this week on the season five finale of the Your Money, Your Wealth TV show, Joe and Big Al talk about the making of a retirement millionaire. Watch online at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Now, according to Google, Warren Buffett is worth $82.7 billion. You think he might know something about becoming a retirement millionaire? Here's the second way to get yourself a free book. Click special offer at yourmoneyyourwealth.com to get your copy of Think, Act, and Invest Like Warren Buffett by Larry Swedro for more motivation on your path to retirement millionaire status. Now let's get back to those money questions. Here's Carl from Indiana. I have a pension and 401k from my company I work at. I'm retiring from there at age 57. I have the option to roll my 401k into my pension plan and draw a monthly paycheck. Will I be subject to a 10% penalty because I'm not 59 and a half years old? Okay. <clears throat> now, again, with these questions, Carl, um, there's two things he's either referring to. He's either buying back years of service through his 401k plan. To get a higher benefit. To get a higher benefit pension benefit amount. Right. So there's two different types of plans that he has. He has a defined benefit plan and a defined contribution plan. Uh, the defined benefit plan is basically um, how it works is that the benefit that Carl will receive is usually based on three things. Years of service. How many years does he put into the company? His age. How old is he when he's going to start claiming that retirement benefit? And then his income when he retires. So it could be either, you know, a, a five, 10 year average of his highest 10 years of income. It could be three years, five years, whatever. Um, so in some cases, it sounds like Carl has that in his um, employment there in Elkhart, Indiana. Right. Is that they have an option to roll my 401k into a pension plan and draw a monthly paycheck. This could mean so many different things. He could be saying here, too, that is someone telling him to roll a 401k into some sort of annuity to get a, a pension, right? Could Quasi be. Quasi man-made or, or, pension. Or, or maybe the 401k has some sort of payout 
regular payout option, and maybe it's just all within the 401k. Right. Um, will I be subject to 10% penalty because I'm not 59 and a half? That's his real question. Right. I don't know. It's really going to depend. If he's buying back service credits, no. If it's in his employer's plan, no. If he's going to roll it into another retirement account and take a pension, no. So I would say 95%, no matter what scenario, falls in this. Well, assuming that he like he retired after age 55, which it sounds like because he said he's retiring at age 57. So uh, that if he rolled the 401k to an IRA and then started pulling money out, there would be a penalty because that, that rule is 59 and a half. But in the 401k world, if, as long as you separate from service at age 55, then you can take those distributions. You have to pay tax on it, but you don't get penalized. You don't have to wait to 59 and a half. But if he's rolling it into a pension plan and drawing a monthly paycheck, then... Yeah, they, I'm, 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 there's, I'm, there's no penalty there, I, I would agree. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I guess if someone's going to ask a question like that, I think, help me out. Tell me what like company you work for. Then I can look at the plan. Right. And then tell you like very specifically what you can and cannot do. Right. Because the problem with this is that people screw up words and they get confused. It's like, well, here, can I roll my 401k into like the, the one lady that keeps emailing us is that she doesn't want to get double taxed because she did the 60 day rollover. She blew it up. Right. She did two 60 day rollovers. Yep. And so she's like, well, well, will I get double taxed again because I want to put it in the Roth? I'm like, you cannot put it in the Roth. It's done. It's too late. It's fully distributed from the retirement account, fully taxed. You cannot put that money into a Roth IRA. And she's like, well, okay, well, do you think I'll get double taxed when I put it in the Roth? <laughs> no, you cannot put it in the Roth. <laughs> All right. Let's... So, so with Carl, um, because if he's saying, I mean, some advisors get 401k in pension. Yes, confused. I, I've seen that in person. <laughs> so um, I can understand why an individual gets confused with just, all right, is this a 401k, a pension? Yeah, I don't know. What, what, what's the difference? Who yeah, cares, right? right. Well, it, it can actually mean uh, quite a bit to you. All right, we got Daniel. Um, he's from San Diego. He goes, hey, Joe. Perfect, Daniel. You know you'll get your answer questioned <laughs> appropriately. Um, if I have an existing Roth account that will mature next year, can I transfer funds from a pension to the existing Roth account and still use that money when the account matures without penalties? Or what I have to wait another five years to withdraw the funds from the added funds from the pension? I know I will have to pay 20% to the government, but not the additional 10% because I'm 62 but will I have to report it as income at the end of the year? All right, Daniel, let's dissect what the heck you're trying to, uh, what language we're speaking here. Yeah, let's. <laughs> so he's got an existing Roth account that will mature next year. So that could mean one of two things. That could mean that he started a Roth IRA four years ago and he's waiting for the five year clock. And so he's thinking, all right, well, now I've had this Roth for five years, all contributions. All conversion, whatever, is going to be distributed out to me 100% tax-free. Or he bought a product within his Roth IRA, and maybe it's a CD, maybe it's an annuity, maybe it's something else that's not liquid, and it matures where you have a liquidity event. What do you think he's talking about? The, I actually, when I when you first read it, I thought the second, but now I think it's the first. I think he's talking about the five-year clock, because that's what he's referring to after the next question. So let's define the five-year clock. The five-year clock means this. is contributions, as you put money into a Roth IRA, uh, the IRS says, okay, if you want to contribute to a Roth IRA, there's a five-year clock to get a qualified distribution out of the Roth IRA tax-free. So qualified distribution means, A, that you the money has to be seasoned in the Roth IRA for five years. you got to be over 59 and a half. Or if there's death or disabil uh, disability. Disability. Thank you. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, so he's thinking, all right, I've had this Roth for four years. Uh, it's ready to mature. I get it for five. But also, Dan, you'll know that if this is a, a contributory Roth IRA, you have access to the contributions at any point. 
So just realize that if you put $5,000 in three or four years ago and you need that $5,000 today, you have full access to it, uh, no penalties, no taxes, nothing. And that's at any age. At any age. Yeah, so and people don't know that. Yeah, you have full liquidity of the Roth contribution. Oh, the contribution. Roth conversion, different story. Different story, and then same with the earnings. The earnings need to be 59 and a half or five years, whichever is longer. Right. So he's 62 years old. His next sentence is... Um, can I transfer funds from a pension to the existing Roth account and still use that money when the account matures without penalties? All right. So if I define this as a pension, uh, Al, you used to do this. You used to call every single retirement account a pension. <laughs> Did I? <laughs> he finally trained me. Huh? Yeah, it just took 15 years. <laughs> so a pension could be a 401k. It could be a 403b. It could be a TSP. It could be a lump sum pension. It could be. So he's 60. Or, or it could be a 401k with a Roth component. It could be anything. Yeah. <laughs> so, and if he's saying, uh, um, I'm going to transfer funds from a pension to the existing Roth account. So maybe, or that could be a conversion of some account is what be. I'm really I'm guessing what he's talking about. Well, I guess whether it's a conversion and he has to pay the tax or it's a Roth component of a 401k where he doesn't have to pay the tax, I think the question is, does that blow the five-year clock? Well, it depends. So if you're looking at a conversion, has its own separate five-year clock until he turns 59 and a half. But he's 62. He's 62, so that waves that other five-year clock. Mm -hmm. If he was under 59 and a half, I would have a different answer for him. I agree with that. Because what they're trying to eliminate is that, let's say I'm 40 years old, I do a conversion, I have to wait five years to have access to the converted money. So I'm 45, I can take the money out, no penalty free. Right. Uh, penalty free. Um, before, that wasn't the case. You could convert and take the money out the next year. Uh, but then people just did that and avoided the 10% penalty. Yeah, so one thing, uh, Daniel, to ease your mind, once you start the five-year clock, it starts it for all Roth IRAs. You got it. So, yeah, no, it doesn't start over. So if, if that's... You convert, it still matures next year. If we're, if we're answering the right question, which I think we are. I think so. <laughs> then, yeah, no, you don't have to start over in the five years. Um, or what, I have to wait another five years. I know I have to pay 20% to the government. So I'm not sure where he's coming up with 20% either. Well, then it might be a conversion. Maybe he's thinking that's the tax he thinks he's going to have to pay. But there's, there's no 20% tax bracket, Al. I know. I mean, right? Just... But this is the problem. When but... people start doing stuff on their own, they listen to the show for like five minutes, and then they start executing stuff. But what's that? And then we also get questions. It's like, oh, I, I, you know, I screwed up the 60-day you know, the, the, the rollover and because I did it twice to two different accounts because I... You know, I couldn't find a notary, and then it's like, well, here, if I do a conversion again, am I going to get double tax? It's like, no, it's already done. You can't do the conversion. Right. With this guy, he's like, well, 20%. How about if he's in the 39% tax bracket, he's got a $500,000 pension, he converts it into a Roth IRA, assuming that he only has to pay 20%. Right. Or if it's from a 401k, he's going to say, yeah, automatically withhold 20%. Next April, he's got another tax bill of another, let's say, hundred grand that he has to go to his retirement account to pay the tax. How many times have we seen that? Yeah, or he could be saying, "I'm going to get, I'm going to pull my 401k money out, have 20 percent withheld, then I'm going to put it. Then in I'm the going to put it in the rock. And you can't do that, right? That blows it all so up. So just be, there, yeah. There's a few things you want to make sure you get right. Yeah, and you have to understand the terms too, because Daniel's using all sorts of different types of terms. It's like, okay, when my Roth matures. I don't know really what that means. There's, or when uh, my, my, I'm moving my pension and I got to pay 20%. So, Daniel, just try to get a little bit more specific so you don't blow anything up. Hopefully, uh, you listen to this before you make any action. Uh, join us next week. We got a lot more fun to go. For Big Al Clopine, I'm Joe Anderson. The show's called Your Money or Wealth. Yes, before you make any financial action, make sure you're doing it right. Scroll down to Ask Joe and Al on air at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Send them a voice message or an email. Get a smart answer, possibly in video form, and get a free copy of Larry Swedro's book, Think, Act, and Invest Like Warren Buffett. Special thanks to today's guest, Brian Portnoy. For more information about Brian and his latest award winning book, The Geometry of Wealth, How to Shape a Life of Money and Meaning. Find links in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com, where you'll also find links to share and subscribe to the YMYW podcast on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You can listen on YouTube or on your favorite podcast app. Your Money, Your Wealth is presented by Pure Financial Advisors for your free two-meeting financial assessment with a certified financial
financial planner, just click the free assessment button at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Pure Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full and informed investment decision. Next week, let's talk about what's going on in the markets. What do you say? We'll see you then.